Thank you so much um, for that. You know, it's it's great to be here at my alma mater, Georgetown Law. Facilities are a little bit nicer than when when I was a student here, but the quality of the professors and the deans and all remain among the absolute best. And I, I think those of you who are students here at Georgetown are fortunate uh, to be here. It's a part of my life and Marcel's life that I've always cherished when I was here. But also, to be with good friends like Gary Hart and Fritz Mondale. Uh, Senator Hart and I were elected to the Senate uh, the same year, and, and we were immediately a chance to meet with then Senator Mondale and Senator Humphrey from Minnesota. The very first vote we cast was for the church committee. And I remember we were both the newest members on the Senate Armed Services Committee. And I was a junior most member. And the, um, the chair of the committee John Stennis, as some of you recall, did not like the idea. You may recall his discussions, uh, Doctor, with, with Frank Church on this. He did not like the idea of having a church committee. He said uh, to Senator Church, you know, they'll, they'll tell me, the CIA and the others will tell me everything that I need to know. And Senator Church said, yes, but you tell me you don't want to know. And that was the difference. And there's a famous photograph by George Thames is in the New York Times, and it shows John Stennis uh, lecturing Frank Church, saying, you can't have this. And Church kind of looking at him like you know, a man 30 years younger and saying, I'm going to have it. I was standing right behind as a junior most member, right behind George Thames. We took that picture, and it summed up everything that went on. But people like Fritz Mondale and Gary Hart, others made sure, and Mike Mansfield, that we would have this. And thank goodness we did. Because that was the first time we really started looking and asking what our government is <coughs> doing. And not accepting, well, we can't tell you because it would damage national security. It's a watershed moment in history, and I remain proud of that first vote. Actually, Gary and I had a couple other votes in that committee in, in April of that year, April 1975. We voted by a one-vote margin to cut off authorization for the Vietnam War. And uh, they sure. cast that vote over and over again, trying to change us, and, and we did not. Um, but let's talk about the church committee. Through their work, and these are the people who talk further about it, Bill Miller remembers so well the aspects of what went on there. The American public learned of years of excesses and abuses that occurred in the secretive and largely unchecked intelligence community. And the revelations made clear that change was needed. They led to the enactment of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 1978 the establishment of the Congressional Intelligence Committees to provide ongoing, comprehensive oversight of our intelligence agencies. But today, now, it's 40 years, almost 40 years later, and we're at a watershed moment. It's time for another change. This summer, many Americans learned for the first time, but only a few of us knew, the Section 215 of the USA Patriot Act has for years been secretly interpreted to authorize the collection of Americans' phone records on an unprecedented scale. And they learned that the NSA has engaged in repeated, substantial legal violations in its implementation of Section 215 and other surveillance authorities. Now, I don't condone the way that these and other highly classified programs have been disclosed. I remain concerned about the potential damage to our intelligence gathering capabilities and national security. And we've not seen things so sinister as the secret campaign 
to smear Dr. Martin Luther King that the church committee unearthed. I credit the church committee with the oversight powers we now have and the Congress now using to take a fresh look at what our government is doing under the guise of national security. But new technology has led to the proliferation of data and surveillance on a scale not previously imaginable. And it certainly wasn't contemplated by the Congress in the wake of the Church Committee. None of us could have even conceived of the way data, information, uh, communications would take place 40 years after the Church Committee. Americans increasingly live online. We create electronic records of their daily activities without even realizing it. All of us know you can't have the police just walk into your house and search through a filing cabinet for your records. Comes the other question when those records are stored in the cloud or in other people's data banks. Americans communicate a lot differently than we used to. Our we have a digital footprint almost everywhere we go. Uh, those of you who walked in here with your cell phones on, you left a record of where you were. So that's why I authored bipartisan legislation to update our criminal law regarding the privacy of our email content. And that's why I think the Congress has to take a hard look at the authorities we afford uh, the Intelligence Committee. The rapid change technology has dramatically affected the FISA court. Now, the FISA court is a good idea for oversight, but it's no longer simply reviewing wiretap applications to make fact-based classified assessments about whether individual surveillance requests follow a statutory standard. Now they're rendering very complex constitutional decisions about massive surveillance programs have major implications for Americans' privacy. We were discussing some of these at dinner last night. Uh, the, the tremendous difference in that 40 years, and that's why I think, uh, Dean, you've done a wonderful thing having as knowledgeable a, a panel as this to talk about it. They're conducting oversight of highly technical programs that even the agency running them apparently did not understand and certainly did not accurately report to the court. Let me emphasize that. They didn't understand it, and they didn't accurately report it to the court, and they're doing this all in secret, and the court doesn't have the advantage of there being an adversarial process where somebody might say, what about this? In fact, a whole body of secret laws developed and has considerable implication for our democracy. Time and again, Congress was asked to reauthorize Surveillance authorities affect our fundamental notions of privacy, but without the ability to discuss publicly those programs or the legal and constitutional interpretations upon which the government relies. Only recently has it become possible for us to challenge openly the government's false assertion that it is necessary to collect the phone records of every single American to keep our country safe. I mean, just think about it logically. If you're collecting everything, in some ways you could say you're collecting nothing. How are you ever going to go through it? I'm convinced that the system set up in the 1970s to regulate the surveillance capabilities of our intelligence community is no longer working. And we have to recalibrate. First, we have to address the scope of the government's national security surveillance powers, particularly when directed at Americans. In my view, and I've discussed this with the White House, the Section 215 bulk collection of Americans' phone records must end. It's not making America safer. And the government has not made its case that this is an effective counterterrorism tool, especially in the light of the intrusion of Americans' privacy rights. And I've introduced bipartisan legislation that would end bulk collection allowing the intelligence community to continue collection under Section 215 and other authorities if it's properly authorized and properly targeted. And I think, I don't want to put words in Vice President Mondale or Senator Hart's 
Miles, but I think they would agree that Congress did not enact FISA in order to give the government dragnet surveillance powers that could sweep in the data of countless innocent Americans. That's not what the FISA court is for. Secondly, we need to take a hard look at the existing oversight structure. What we're asking of the judges that are appointed to the FISA court. I don't question their integrity or their dedication. I do not agree with those who caricature it as an unthinking rubber stamp for government surveillance. But we have to recognize the fact that the FISA court judges have assumed a regulatory role not envisioned in the original version of FISA. And they often evaluate the adequacy of guidelines and procedures and the government's compliance with them. But they have to, do, they have to evaluate that, what, for example, what the NSA is doing, but when the senior officials at the NSA do not themselves understand the technical boundaries of the programs they manage, or when they give inaccurate explanations to the court, and they have, how do we expect the court to fulfill its role? It can't be done. Other oversight mechanisms, including greater use of inspectors general, need to be considered, as well as possible structural changes to the FISA court process. So the Senate Judiciary Committee will continue to play its key oversight role. We have a lengthy history of working on it, dating back to the 1970s, even before I was there. Its members have expertise in privacy, civil liberties, I have a, a wonderful staff who have all the kind of clearances, understand us, and can work on it. And we have others that we consult with. So I'm convening a classified briefing for committee members tomorrow. We will do that classified briefing tomorrow, but then we'll have an open hearing next week when Director of National Intelligence Clapper and National Security Agency Director Alexander will testify. And I expect open and candid testimony. And to that end, I'm working with Congressman Sensenbrenner, Chairman of the Crime and Terrorism Subcommittee in the House, as well as Senator Lee on the Senate Judiciary Committee on a Legislative Solution. I'm consulting with Congressman Goodlight. I was encouraged by his views the other day. What I'm saying is this is not a liberal or conservative issue, Democratic or Republican. We're going to have to have a bipartisan, open uh, response in the same way we did with the church committee, something we're not seeing on the Hill these days. We've got to come back to that for the good of the country. And finally, we have to examine with a fresh eye the extent to which our domestic surveillance programs have to remain classified. Now, I have no doubt that our national security has been released by some of the information that's been in the news, particularly our activities abroad. But we've got to find a way that we can discuss publicly the outer bounds of government authority to surveil Americans. Congress was able to do that in the 70s. We can do it again. And you know, more than 38 years after I cast my first vote on the floor of the Senate, we have to continue to fight to ensure the privacy rights and civil liberties of Americans are not swept aside in the name of national security. It is not an either-or thing, your privacy and national security. I, um, I say almost facetiously, there's, there's an article, and I mentioned this to some of you, written about me in a profile in the New York Times. It's actually some, one of the very few things I've saved from the press, even frame. Uh, it gives an idea of how we feel about privacy in Vermont. Marcel and I live on a, a dirt road in an old farmhouse, a dead-end road. I love land around it. We've had it a long time. We spent part of our honeymoon there over 50 years ago. But we have, and there's a joining farm family that's hayed our fields and kind of watched over the place from the time I was a teenager. And the whole story goes like this. It's a Saturday morning. Porter drives up in an out-of-state car. Farmer sitting on the porch, he says, does Senator Leahy live up this road? He said, are you a relative of his? He said, no, I'm not. Are you a friend of his? Well, not really. Is he expecting you? No. Never heard of him. <laughs> <laughs> we, like our, we like our privacy. We like our privacy. We like our oversight. 
We like having our elected officials know what the heck is going on in our government, and that's why you're so darn lucky to hear from these people today. Thank you very, very much.